Chen Tu. Okay. <laughs> I think, generally speaking, uh, U.S. still has more leading and very advanced technologies than China. China is still uh, catching up, and in the past 30 years of reform and open up, China has achieved uh, a lot of progress, but U.S. has been developing in the past 100 years, and that is the accumulation of 100 and 200 years. U.S. has a very uh, solid foundation for innovation and creativity, so it's a bit a bit like the water at the upper stream, and the upper stream water will flow downstream. Uh, if there is no water from upper stream to downstream, then the downstream will go uh, like uh, quite stark. I mean, without the downstream, upper stream will also have problems because the market in those downstream places will also play a critical role uh, for the upper stream. That is what history tells us, and for our society, we didn't, uh, the society is marching towards urban cooperation. That is a definite trend. Why the world stopped the market economy? Because market economy has a balance of different factors, and this balancing of factors uh, is managing the health or maintaining a healthy and robust development of the market. Think about it, if there are a lot of uh, rabbits, and if there is a lion, <laughs> then uh, there are so many rabbits for the lion to consume. Uh, uh, so I don't think the world plays by jungle rules. And also, countries are governed by laws, regulations, and beliefs religions and ethics, all those restrictive factors uh, will make sure the world will not follow jungle rules and there is anti-monopoly law. Uh, if the lion gets quite strong, then the lion can only get so strong, not any further. Well, that is a natural balance of different forces. Well, Huawei happens to be leading in 5G and we will not be complacent. We still want to openly collaborate with the world. So first of all, I think you mentioned the decoupling. I think both issues as they come and we will deal with those issues. If things are not as challenging as all of you illustrated. I feel so happy as a journalist. But now, here's another thing. We could not only just concentrate our conversation on Huawei and the current specific point of challenge, but rather where we're going from here. Every one of us. Um, Mr. Yuan has been very passionate about 5G. That's certainly going to build the infrastructure in the world to empower communication and many others. Mr. Gilder has been, over the years, arguing about that artificial intelligence is not going to replace human being, but human capacity and also human brain is enormous. Meanwhile, uh, Mr. Necroponte, you have been arguing in many of your speeches and books about the biotech is the new digital, uh, as you have written a book of being digital back in the 1990s. The Everybody read it. Uh, yeah, well, <laughs> and you, you argue even that we can probably eat a pill from now on and learn Chinese, not through the eyes, but through within the body. So what kind of future? You don't from really the, say that. Yes, I do. <laughs> yes, he did. He talked about French. I say French. it. Well, that doesn't mean it's true. No, it certainly isn't <laughs> true. So <laughs> I'm glad that But it could be. That, no, it couldn't be. Yes, it could. Well, no, it, ideas are not let's material. Start. That, that's just a fundamental misconception. That, uh, Nor are pills, once they get into your bloodstream. <laughs> yeah, so let me ask one by one if we can, and Crossfire is also welcomed here on the stage, <laughs> about where are we talking about, and what would you concentrate about a bigger trend? Let's start from what many call a futurist. Mr. Gilder? Um, I believe that the uh, basic challenge of the world economy today is to address the scandal of money. We today 
have $5.1 trillion every 24 hours of currency trading. And these, this currency trading accomplishes nothing except to endow central banks with the right to steal from the future in order to consume in the present and uh, steal from future generations. And uh, I believe that the great, the real reason for the trade war is not trade or, or industrial machinations, it's the collapse of money. So uh, $5.1 trillion a day of currency trading is 25 times all global GDP. It's 75 times all trade in goods and services. And it doesn't even prevent uh, constant hedging of every transaction across the border. It doesn't uh, prevent trade uh, conflicts. It, it doesn't uh, really accomplish its goal. Okay. And so I think that the great contribution of blockchains is to allow a new global currency that plays the role that gold played for hundreds of years of the fastest growth of the world economy. And that's really what uh, blockchain, uh, not only a new internet architecture, but also a new global architecture for the world economy. And you don't think that's virtual wealth only, just like the stockbrokers? It's, it's not wealth itself, it's the measuring stick of wealth that guides entrepreneurial visions and creativity. You've got to have a measuring stick just as you need to measure the second, the kilogram, the, the ampere, the mole, all the various uh, measuring sticks that make it possible to make a chip in Taiwan and incorporate it in a smartphone in Shenzhen and send it to Cupertino for marketing and to Israel for amplification and all that is made possible by common measuring sticks. The nanometer is the same in Shenzhen as it is in Timbuktu. Hmm. And, but money which is a critical measuring stick, is different all around the world. It's being manipulated by national central banks. And so we have a chaos of money. And that's why the world economy is slowing down now, is why trade is no longer growing, why countries are constantly fragmenting and, uh, and fighting over uh, valuations mm. and and I think this is uh, the big opportunity I think Huawei can play a key role in in surmounting this challenge well, let Mr. Yuan to respond a bit later but for you Mr. Necropondi of course you disagree with your friend no no I don't disagree with that because I don't know <laughs> enough about that uh, <laughs> and it's it's fascinating to listen to um, I would take because I believe the question was, what are some of the big future exactly. trends? And I think they all surround one aspect of the scientific and technical world that has changed in the past 30 years. And that is that we can make things and design things and build things that are so small and get smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller that there's been a crossover point with nature. And when I grew up, the natural world and the artificial world were very different. In fact, I was trained as an architect, and good architecture is the architecture that fits well with the natural world. But now the natural world and the artificial world are the same. Mm. And they're the same in ways that are very surprising. When I founded the Media Lab, I never imagined we would have a team, as we have today, who design mice. They design new mice. And are the mice real or are they artificial? They're, they're manufactured they're, and, and they're walking, living mice. And so there's certain things that you think about. For example, 10 years from now, maybe Huawei will 
ship base stations as seeds that you plant and you water it and it grows. And guess what? It grows into a base station and it's powered by the sun and the leaves and it sort of generate and all of a sudden you have base stations in the <laughs> middle of nowhere. Ten years from now, that's perfectly plausible. So I think the changes, the reason I say biotech is the new digital, more because of synthetic biology and the fact that be indistinguishable. Mm. So I, I look in that area. Mm. And the world of the digital is also in combination <laughs> with the world of biotech. Very much the same. Yeah. Mr. is very happy, growing from a seed is something that you can discuss. You seem to be happy about that idea. What about your future? What do you think? Nicholas was talking about uh, the convergence between DNA and the electronics, and what might be the dramatic consequences and outcomes on human society. So I don't comment on that because I have not done any research into that. But I think in the next 20 to 30 years, for human society, the biggest driving force will be artificial intelligence. Because the society is getting more and more complicated, the trains are traveling faster and faster. Networks are also becoming more complicated. This is simply something that one individual with whatever level of intelligence can control and in the future, so some of these like tasks with the sensitivity AI try. could do that. It's already processed by AI. You don't transmit it through the network for things that are not as certain, and then you use AI as assistance to provide analysis. AI might be wrong, AI might be uh, right. And it's a process of deep learning to optimize human society. I mentioned just now we should be tolerant about innovation. We should not be very particular around whether this is right or wrong. Uh, uh, yeah. As for something, some people are talking about Remote uh, maintenance. <laughs> Whether people have to climb on the tower to do maintenance, that's high cost. So, for the future innovation, there needs to be a certain level of a tolerance in order to embrace the great era that is yet to come. And I should not be solely viewed as something negative. AI is the extension of a human capability. And then then you you the world, and then you read the real you the real you can take a full view and say, you the real you can take a full view and say, you can you can you can take a full view you can take a full view and say, you can take a full view and say, you can take a full view and say, you can take a full view and can only be produced with a supercomputer and a high-speed computer. Nicholas mentioned just now several uh, decades uh, earlier. Some, some already put forward the idea of AI, but today we have the condition to make it happen that can only produce more wealth. And it's not about replacing people. Some people mentioned just now. How AI could appreciate the human or the music. If you listen to the song, it's not just about that. You need to appreciate the music. Whether AI can produce something similar to talking musician, I cannot tell for, uh, for now. I can tell right now, it seems the teacher and Ms. You have certain chemistry. common ground uh, between the so-called teacher and the student. Mr. Gilder, it seems that they are disagreeing to a certain extent with what you just said. Well, I, I've been studying connectome studies <laughs> for a while, and the connectome, uh, for years I studied the connectome of the Internet. That is, how much, uh, how large are all the connections all across the entire global Internet and connections to all its memories, and I was always focusing on the point where the connectome of the global internet would pass a zettabyte. That is, all the memories and all the connections would take a zettabyte, 10 to the 21, to map. Uh, and recently I've been studying the connectome of the human brain, one human brain. 
and the connectome of the human, one human brain takes an entire zettabyte. In other words, one human brain has as much connectivity <laughs> as the entire global internet. Yet the entire global internet consumes gigawatts, terawatts of energy. One human brain runs on 12 to 14 watts of energy. So I believe that what really will determine human progress and prosperity is unleashing individual human zettabytes running at 12 watts, that six billion of them that you're interconnecting through the Huawei fiber optics and wireless, not creating some some super mouse out of a pill. I mean, I, I, the life is not the same <laughs> as electronics. Okay. It, it manifests electronics, but it's a different phenomenon which is not well understood and is not illuminated by facile statements that uh, uh, we're going to be able to read Shakespeare by taking a pill. That just okay. is not illuminating. Okay, Mr. Necropondi, I think it's perfect time for you to speak out. Look, whatever is true in computation and connectivity, mm. I can make more of it. I can make more and more of it. And some of that's going to happen naturally. More. So a lot of people have worked, and there are really two kinds, very two distinct AIs. There's the AI, if you will, that wants to do as well or better than the human brain. That's the one that is, I'll call the classic one. It's the one that the people in the 1960s and 70s, very deep thinkers, were thinking about. It was not an AI composed of 7.5 billion people. I don't know what you guys are doing with the other 1.5, by the way, when you talk about connecting everybody. But when you have the 7.5 billion brains connected, you have something times 7.5 billion. And I, that's a different area and a fascinating one. And whatever happens computationally, I just know I can make more of it. I can't make more of the human brains, and ours aren't going to change that much. So things will change, George. And I think, you know, when I say you learn French by taking a pill or Chinese, mm. that is part of a very different agenda of how do you interact with the human brain. And the breakthrough was the idea of going from the inside instead of the outside, mm. instead of trying to radiate. What if you went through the bloodstream and what if you were able to access all the neurons from that direction? Mm. That's pretty interesting. And I don't know where French lives. Does it live in a part of your brain? Probably not, but the process to speak French certainly does. Can you put that there? Can you take it away? It doesn't matter whether that is correct or not right now. It's certainly a very exciting way of thinking about it, and people will do things and change things as a consequence taking that kind of step. Pill or not pill, that is not the question. Right. The really question is, what are we going to see in the future? So let's talk about the future also a little bit more. Uh, for example, lifelong learning, Mr. Ren, lifelong learning, certainly is going to be extremely important for everyone, no matter what kind of future we're talking about. So to all of you, how does that happen? What is the best tool? What is your way of lifelong learning? I'm sure you have to learn very fast, particularly recently. No matter how fast you are, you are not as fast as machines. No matter how long you commit yourself to learning, your life is always limited. So we think AI can inherit the civil, uh, people of human civilization. The way scientists think can be inherited through a set of mathematical models, the way of thinking of Einstein, 
can be inherited in hundreds or even thousands of years down the road. Therefore, I think AI is going to create enormous opportunity for humanity. But how the opportunity looks like, we can never depict for now. It's like when I was young, when I was a kid, there is no way that I can imagine that there will be so many Cars in Beijing because in 1958, once we had one day off from uh, uh, school, and then we went out to the road to see the trucks because we sell them so down. So today we see a lot of traffic jam no matter where you are. So similarly today, it's hard for us to imagine how future society will look like. But I think a lifelong learning is an incentive to one individual. But the learning at a general level, you need to have a lifeless succession, and that would be done with machine learning. Uh, to understand the algorithms constant review, revising, and optimizing fundamental models. That's how this whole system will be held together. Um, simple ways will be used to understand the sophistication. Today, there are so many different problems in the future. Maybe very few people will be able to figure out those difficult questions. So, to me, the issue of the lifelong learning should not be discussed at the individual level. Fortunately, some people might try, uh, try to approach AI from an emotional point of view. That's only in the literature. In society, you have a laws, you have a relation, you have a moral ethics, and many other ways to try to counterbalance some of the possible negative consequences of AI. We think wealth will only grow, not really decrease, with the right tools. Some people are saying the Chinese people are getting rich, and people now like to eat fish. But look at the Google map. Uh, there are these fishing nets in coastal areas. If you use Google map, a lot of the fish, they use man-made way of uh, raising fish. So it's not coming at the cost of natural resources. So it's a science or technology innovation to create a new wealth. Of course, I think the society should be a society of economy instead of a luxury. Norway is a country that is very developed. But what impressed me the most is Norway people, they live in small apartments, they drive in small cars. Well, all of the office in Norway, they cannot afford to use their own cars. So when I would go to Norway, I take a train to visit our grand office. So that's the practice of economy. So on the one hand, there is an abundance of wealth, but people precise economy, not really try to enjoy something luxury. And the people's ability to create resources would be stronger, and I don't think a wall is possible. Not only about the education, but also about the future of our society. Just learning about the society can continue to improve. Can I have you first before I go to you? I'll have Mr. Chen first. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
it's an interesting world, isn't it? It's a bigger no, world no. than many people imagine. No. <laughs> Good job. But and it's, and it's not bigger than a, the universe and <laughs> Ren's cup of coffee. It's, uh, <laughs> it's really, we get a, a sense of his visionary horizons when he discourses on AI. I don't think any other corporate leader in the world could uh, give such a sophisticated and wide-ranging analysis of this absolutely central uh, theme of uh, technological development. And that's why the United States has to come to terms with Huawei. It's, it's a resource for the world. It's not a, a little uh, combatant a uh, figure dealing with back doors and little security. Uh, uh, Mr. Gilder, you really sure, sound yeah. quite a fan of Huawei. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Negroponte. <laughs> well, your description is certainly poetic, amongst other things, which yeah. is very important. Uh, I would like to go back to your question, original yeah. question, which was about lifelong learning and I would like to just remind people that learning is what you do to yourself and education is what people do to you. Let me just separate the two. And if you look at the best education in the world, it falls in two very distinct groups. There is the group which is characterized by Finland, Sweden, and Norway, where they do very, very well, but there are no tests, shortest hours per day, shortest days per year, and no competition at all. So you, the kids do very, very well. And then there is, let me, since I'm in China, let me say the Chinese method, which is drill and practice and tests, and you probably kill 50% of your children in the process of doing that. But they, the ones who survive come out strong. Now, I think the second one is a very bad way to do it. And I think the first one is the one that the world will slowly model itself. It doesn't have much traction, mm. but as you connect kids, thanks to Huawei, and as you bring this connectivity to very remote places, it's amazing what kids can do. And I will bore you with one experiment we did. We went to two villages mm. in Ethiopia that had no literacy. No, no adult had ever seen a word, a written word. They hadn't seen one. And we put in the village the number of tablets as there were kids with no human beings and no instructions. And we left. Now the one exception is an adult went the day before and showed another adult how to put the solar panel outdoors instead of indoors. That was it. Remotely we could monitor this. Within two hours, the kids found the on-off switch, mm. which is pretty hard because there are no on-off switches in their life. <laughs> Within a week, they were singing ABC songs. Within two weeks, they were using 50 apps per day for seven hours per day. That's how long the battery. Six months later, they hacked Android. <laughs> <laughs> and today they speak read and write fluent English. No teacher. Without the pill. No pill. Before the pill. And no teacher. What's very important <laughs> is that you can do a great deal of self-learning. I don't advocate that's the way to do it for everybody, but it's amazing what kids can do, mm. and we underestimate them all the time. Beautiful. That's said. the Zenobite I was talking about. <laughs> Finally, you agree on something. Oh, we agree. I feel so relieved. We agree on many yeah, things. most things. <laughs> okay. But there's one thing I also want to ask you about. That is, you know, you talk about the potential beauty of a world in which everybody could work together, going through this uh, current bump. But it is happening. And therefore, a lot of people that I've been talking to as a journalist have real concerns whether their children's generation are really going to enjoy the kind of life that you guys have been enjoying over the decades, which is you see your life taking up, going up, you getting better, your life's getting better all the time. But maybe the next generation, some are concerned, are not going to be 
as beautiful as that. Mr. Necroponte, you've been working with kids a lot. A hundred dollar laptop for them <laughs> to go to the world of digital. What do you think? Well, let me... In it's actually a question of optimism or a little bit pessimistic. Right, but in, in full disclosure, I was born very lucky. My parents were rich, their parents were rich, and their parents were rich. Everybody went to college, everybody traveled. We moved all over the world. I'd gone to 30 countries by the time I was four years old. So it was, I didn't think of that as privilege. And none of my brothers went into business. We all went into civil service or academia. Right. A couple of them are artists. So our measure wasn't the same measure that you're talking about because very often we think of measure sh simply as an economic growth. Mm -hmm. But after you have that economic growth, you have a purpose. And you die unhappy if you didn't really have a good purpose and you look back at your life and you say, oh, what was that all about? Mm -hmm. Well, some people don't have that question because they've had a purpose and they are allowed to have it. But if you're struggling the whole time, it's harder. So I think that, that when I hear that young people won't have the same opportunities, I say to myself, well, you know, I don't think that's necessarily true because they do have something we didn't have. It didn't matter if you were rich or poor. Mm -hmm. There was a belief that you had to work for a certain pe period of time and probably hate your work. Okay. As a lawyer, as a banker, as a hedge fund. I mean, God, hedge funds, what an empty life that is. And then at the end, you start doing something with the rest of your life. There's sort of something happens. And I think young people have learned that that too can be more integrated. Mm -hmm. And I see many, many more young people who have mixed money and meaning. Okay. I think that's the key. That is the key. No offense, hedge funds around the world. Well, offense, hedge funds, yeah. actually. Okay. You should be ashamed of yourself if you're in the hedge fund business. To support education. Yeah. That's very important. That's important. Mr. 